Hey guys, I said I was going to go live, so sorry I'm a little bit late, um, but I just wanted to address all of the um, discussion that was going on today in my stories about this new app for kids targeting weight loss. Um, so I'm just going to do like a brief kind of addressing all the questions I was getting. Um, I'm going to turn off my commenting. Um, because I don't want to be distracted and I really just want to answer the questions I was getting today, the most common ones. But again, I'm going to be talking about this Kerbo Health um, app. I want to talk about dieting um, and kids dieting specifically. And I want to talk about why this is so harmful and why we need to... Hi, Gila. Thank you. Yes, this is important. And I want to talk about why we need to be um, fighting back and talking about this weight loss app and understanding the dangers of it. So I'm just going to turn off the comments um, and I'm just going to address just a few of the things that I wanted to talk about and I guess the most common questions that I was getting today. So this Kerbo app, um, it's basically targeting, it's an app developed by Weight Watchers and it is targeting kids ages 8 to 17. You could be younger to use this app with your parents' permission if they help you. And it is basically teaching them to track their food intake and exercise. And it is um, teaching them also that certain foods are, they're using like a stoplight approach to teach them like some foods are bad, some foods are good, some foods are like neutral. Um, and again, it's, that's dangerous and I'll get into it more because it is promoting the idea that food is good or bad. And it's creating this obsession with food and weight. Um, it also, if you look at the website for Kerbo, it's like horrifying. There's like before and after pictures of kids and their, um, you know, their testimonials, which basically say that their confidence was dependent on their size. Or one of the ones that was so sad to me and like I feel emotional even when I talk about it was this little boy who said, like me and my mom got so close once I started like having healthier habits or being healthier, which meant that in my eyes that the mom's love and closeness was dependent on him having habits that she approved of and that was so sad they have weight loss coaches that like help these kids that have no qualifications they're not registered dietitians necessarily just a health coach and i don't know what that is i can call myself a health coach and that doesn't mean that i'm qualified to be helping people with nutrition um and it ignores the fact that kids are supposed to be growing when they are developing. So eight through 17, those are prepubescent puberty years, kids can gain between 30 to 40 pounds in that time. They need to gain that weight. They need to have that weight on their body. It's normal for them to gain weight. So teaching them that there's something wrong with their bodies for gaining weight is only going to lead to possibly and very likely to disordered eating not eating disorders, disordered eating, but eating disorders too, and I'll, di I'll differentiate between the two what those are. Shame, guilt, feeling like their worth is tied into what they look like. This is just such a dangerous thing, and diet culture tells us that we are only worthy if we're thin, and we are healthy if we're thin, and we are better people and morally superior if we're thin, and that we need to cut out certain foods. Certain foods are good and certain foods are bad, and that we need to be exercising as a form of shrinking ourselves, not as you know something to take care of ourselves. That exercise is a way to kind of like um, to to mitigate the negative effects of the food that we've been eating. So some of the lies diet culture tells us are that diets work, right? So if you're overweight, you should go on a diet to lose weight and that you'll be happy because you'll be thin and you'll be fine. Um, and thin is happiness, right? And your weight determines your worth, that certain foods are good and certain foods are bad. Restriction is the answer. If you're fat, like you should just stop eating so much. Calories in, calories out. Um, losing weight makes you feel better about yourself. Once you lose that weight, you're gonna feel amazing, right? So these are the lies that diet culture tells you about. And a lot of the questions I was getting today, which I wanna address now are, what, but what if my kid is overweight? Like, what do I do? So the answer to that is, uh, there's a few things. Who told you that your child is overweight? What does that mean? You went to the doctor and they weighed them and then they looked at the BMI scale, which if you look in my stories, is not an accurate measure of a person's 
body composition and they told you, oh, your kid is, you know, a little bit high on the scale, they need to lose weight. Is that why you're saying that? You cannot determine someone's weight based on the BMI. We know that the BMI was produced, it was designed 200 years ago by a mathematician, so not even a doctor, who basically like developed this hack for the government who wanted to measure the degree of obesity in the general population, right? So he had no idea like what he was doing. He was just like, all right, weight, height, sounds good. It did not take into account how a person, can, where the person's carrying their body fat, their muscle composition, their race, their gender. And it happens to be that the scale that he developed was only for men, so we're for white men. So we're using a scale that was developed for white men. We're using it, middle-aged men. So we're using it to determine women's health, children's health, and all, all different races of, of men and ages. So it's completely inaccurate. And a lot of doctors recognize that, but they say like, you know what, it's expensive to do an MRI and blood work. And this is the easiest way to determine health even though it's not determining health. So if your doctor's saying, oh, they're a little high on the scale, I would say, okay, well, let's do some blood work. Like, let's look at what's going on and see if they're really unhealthy. If they're unhealthy, that's not gonna be seen from getting on the scale. They can have a bigger body and be fine. So then some people said, yeah, but you know, they, like, they have trouble like playing and running around, like they're getting out of breath. To which I say, your child can be thin and be having trouble running around and getting out of breath also. So the answer to that is not losing weight, it's they need to be more active. Your child needs to run around and play more if they're getting out of breath. This happens, you see people in the gym that are thin and they're dying in an exercise class and you see people that are bigger bodied in, in an exercise class and they're not dying in the class. So that has to do more with your physical health and your capacity to exercise. So if your child is out of breath and can't go up the stairs, that means they need to be more active. It's not because they're fat, because thin kids can have the same problem. Then I saw some questions about, well, what if they can't stop eating? What if they eat way too much at the table and, and, and they'll eat whatever's in front of them and they don't stop eating? To which I say, also, there is this idea, and I know that um, Ellie Sheva Wiener spoke a lot about this. She's a, um, a, a feeding expert. She works with parents and kids to help them learn feeding. Um, she talks a lot about Ellen Satter and her division of responsibility. And basically what that means is that a parent decides, it changes from infant stages to toddler to teen. Infant stages, you feed on demand, right? Babies are intuitive eaters. We are born intuitive eaters. So you feed your baby on demand. As they get older and into toddlerhood, then you start assigning like meal times, right? That there's breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, whatever it is. You decide when meal times are. And then you also decide what is going to be served at those meals. And then your kids get to decide what they eat and how much. So I'm gonna put out for dinner, let's say, um, grilled chicken, broccoli, and sweet potatoes, and one other thing, you know? And like a little bowl of like noodles or quinoa. My kids can then decide from that array of food that I've given what they wanna eat. And I don't say a word, you need to take more of that, you need to take less of this, you need to. We teach our kids to learn what they like, what they, how much they like of it, and eventually they start saying, oh, you know what, maybe I'll try a little bit of the sweet potatoes tonight. They can have one on their plate. If they eat it, amazing, great. You don't say a word. They get to decide and they learn what their bodies like and what they tolerate. And then I have parents saying, oh, but they're only gonna eat the, the pasta if I put it out, or they're only gonna eat the french fries if I put it out. If you don't want that in your home, if you don't want that to be a choice, then don't put it out. Occasionally there should be french fries in the house because if we restrict, then once it's put in front of them, their brain is like, oh my gosh, like the addict, and they want it, they want it, they want it. And we know that that's part of why diets don't work because restriction makes your brain basically obsessed with what it can't have. So you need to look at that also. If your kid sees candy and he cannot stop or she cannot stop, maybe you need to look at how unavailable candy is to them all the time. And don't say, oh, but sugar is addictive, that's why, no. Because if you restrict it from them, then when they're around it, they have zero ability to control themselves. And adults are the same. If you're constantly restricting and then you're at a bar mitzvah or a wedding and they pull out the desserts, you can't just say like, oh, I'm gonna have one and it's delicious and I'm done. You wanna sample every single one and you feel terrible about yourself while you're eating that delicious chocolate souffle and then afterwards you go to the gym the next day and do four classes because you ate too much at the thing and you're punishing yourself. That's not healthy. So 
again, we're promoting these behaviors in kids by giving them this app. We're saying, yeah, track your activity. And yeah, certain foods are good for you and certain foods are bad for you. And some of the foods that are considered not good for them are dairy, whole grain foods, right? Which is insane. They're telling them carbs are not so great, guys. Stay away from that. And the green light foods are um, proteins and I think that was about it. Even almonds were considered not so good for them. So we're demonizing food and we're telling them that some things are just not okay for them to have. So I think a common misconception also about diet culture, being anti-diet culture and being pro-intuitive eating, and I want to tell you guys, you must get this book intuitive eating. It's amazing. It's all about learning how we are born intuitive eaters and going back to that and also challenging all of the cognitive distortions that we have around food and weight and, and talking about diet culture. Just really important talks about honoring our bodies, gentle nutrition. We don't get to eat whatever we want. You, people are like, oh, so my kid can just eat candy all the time? No. Again, division of responsibility. You are going to serve your child those healthy foods. You're going to decide what is served and at what times, and then they get to decide what they have from that. But you're also gonna make time for those play foods like the candy and, and the treats, because if you deprive them of that completely, that, that leads to them feeling like they wanna have more and they're binging and, and all that. Um, disordered eating, what is it? Disordered eating is basically different from eating disorder. Eating disorder has a very specific criteria, like anorexia, bulimia. That's all very specific. Disordered eating is basically dieting, anxiety associated with specific foods, um, weight fluctuations, chronic weight fluctuations, rigid rituals about food and exercise. So I can have pizza, but then I have to go to a spin class afterwards. Or, you know, or if I eat donuts, then I have to do a back-to-back -back class tomorrow. Feelings of guilt and shame associated with eating. So you're at like a thing and, oh, look at all the candy and I'm going to eat that. And like, oh my God, I'm cheating on my diet. Cheating, right? Like as if you're doing something wrong by enjoying those foods. You're preoccupied with food, weight, and your body image. Um, feelings of loss of control around food. And I see this a lot. So many of us have disordered eating that you're like, oh, I can't have that. I can't go near, I can't go to that restaurant. I can't be, you know, I can't go out to dinner tonight with my friends because I'm going to like order the whole menu. Really sad that we feel like we can't even control us, ourselves around that food. Um, using exercise and food restriction, fasting to make up for bad foods. That happens a lot, right? So eating less the next day because you ate so much the night before or eating, um, not eating the whole day so that you can have a bigger meal later on. This impacts your mental health. It's not good for you. Bone loss, gastric, gastrointestinal issues, low heart rate, blood pressure, anxiety, depression. These are all of the things that can be affected by disordered eating. And people also were messaging me, well, what about the health issues that come with being obese or overweight? To which I say, what about all the health issues that come with high stress, obsessing over food, dieting, the damage that it does to your body when you diet. There's clear evidence that the more you diet, the more damage you do to your organs and your body. You're actually healthier just staying at that high weight than you are if you're constantly yo-yoing. You're damaging your, your internal organs and your body and your mental health. If you're sending me messages, I can't see them now because I'm doing this talk. Um, but a study I actually posted in my stories looked at, a sing at BMI as a single measure of cardiovascular health, and it saw that half of the people that were considered overweight by the BMI were actually healthy. And 30% of the ideal BMI people, right, so the people who like weren't considered overweight, had real health issues. So this is something to consider also. When we talk about BMI and the doctor tells you that your kid is high on that scale, you could say, like, you know what, though? Like, he runs around and he has fun and he sleeps well and he's happy and you know he he seems fine so I don't know if that's really an accurate predictor of his health is there any other concerns you have doc no okay so then we're just gonna like let him be and you should also encourage your doctor to prohibit to not engage in any weight talk in front of your kid um, the APA does not recommend weight loss for children they recognize that it promotes disordered eating and eating disorders just not healthy so your child should never be put on a diet you're increasing their chances of mental health issues by doing that so the answer then is when people say well what should I do my kid is overweight 
So again, I say, who says they're overweight? What, what, what measure? And if they are overweight, what does that mean? That means they're not healthy. Weight is not an indicator of health. And what you should do if you are concerned about their health is encourage activity and make nutrition a priority in your home. And that means you don't take them to a nutritionist. It means you yourself go to an intuitive eating nutritionist, a health at any size, at every size um, nutritionist, and you talk to them about the changes that you want to make in your home so that you have a healthier home. And that means also that you think about, well, my kid can't stop eating. Maybe I'm not serving foods that fill him. Maybe they're not making him feel full. And that's why he's so hungry all the time. Or maybe there's some kind of issue. Maybe he's thirsty. Maybe, you know, there, there's a medical issue that I'm missing because I go to the doctor and he just says, oh, he's fat, instead of maybe looking at his blood sugar or doing blood work. Looking at that, asking those questions, um, remembering also that it's important that when you're ch that when you're talking about food that you're not like oh mommy can't have that because she's on a diet no we don't talk like that you could say instead you know what mommy's in the mood for some veggies instead we don't demonize food we don't tell our kids that we're not eating something because we think it's bad and, and wrong for us and that's why we have to address very much our body image issues and our diet culture ideas and our weight stigma um, mentality and understanding what what our thoughts and beliefs are behind it um, and when you go to the doctor I mentioned this also in my stories when you go to the doctor and they say you know I think you need to lose some weight you know you have all these health problems let's say and you need to lose weight then I would say to the doctor let's say I wasn't overweight and I was a thin patient with all of these issues what would you tell the thin patient to do with with this problem let's try that first before I start losing weight um, doctors can be wrong they can misdiagnose. They're also very much um, kind of influenced by weight stigma. They also sometimes believe that weight equals health, and it doesn't. You can be a bigger body person and be healthier than someone who's thin. A small body does not mean a healthy body, and that's important for you to remember for your kids and for yourself. You are not any healthier if you are a size 2 versus a size 12. Health is determined not by the way you look, but by what's going on inside your body. You can only determine your health by looking inside, not by looking at you. I don't, you can't tell if I'm healthy or not. You have no idea. Maybe you would assume I am because I'm not obese or I'm not overweight or whatever it is, but you don't know that. And something I talked about in my podcast on Sinai Radio, which you should listen to, um, where I addressed body image and, and self-acceptance was I talked about how my husband was a live kidney donor in May. And what they had to do before they could you know accept him as a donor was they had to check that he was healthy enough they had to make sure that his body would be able to function with one kidney and handle the surgery and all of that so what happened was they called him in for a battery of tests they didn't just call him in and weigh him and be like oh, great this is your weight perfect bmi check all right you can donate your kidney they did an echocardiogram, they did blood work, they did urine analysis, they did head to toe body scans, blood work, everything you could imagine to find out what was going on inside of his body to determine his health. So why are we putting people on scales and then saying, well, you're not healthy, you know, you weigh 50 pounds more than a person your age should weigh. We cannot determine a person's health by looking at them or weighing them. And I think that we are so brainwashed by diet culture to believe that, to believe that your health is tied to your weight. And I want you guys to start following accounts that that battle this and that educate you on it, that that is not based on anything except a diet industry that wants to make money off of you. And Kerbo Health, getting back to my original point about this, is looking to have more lifelong members by having these kids get onto this app and having these kids be exploited and learn at such a young age that their weight measures their value. And I'm horrified that even with all the protest that we're doing here and all the you know, yelling and kicking and screaming that we're doing that me and so many other mental health professionals and nutritionists are doing, there's still gonna be kids that use this program, that use this app, and there are gonna be kids who feel this shame and embarrassment and sadness and feel that they're only going to be worthy and good if they lose weight at eight years old. Think about what you were doing at eight years old. I think about my eight-year-old, what she's doing now. The thought of her being on a diet and feeling 
bad about her body and feeling like there was something wrong with her for the way she looks is so upsetting and sad to me. Our kids should not be worried about that stuff. They shouldn't be counting calories and thinking about what they're putting in their mouths and worrying if milk is good for them or almonds are bad for them. They should be playing with their friends. They should be on monkey bars. They should be running around. These are healthy behaviors. They should be getting adequate sleep. They should be having fun. They should be getting hugs and kisses from their family. Again, those are healthy behaviors. Those are health-promoting behaviors. That's what they should be doing. So um, I think I answered everything that I wrote down, the questions that I was getting. But I guess the main ones were, um, what if they're overweight? Again, prioritize 30-minute meals with your family, right? Or 30-minute meals that they sit down and for a half hour they eat. Could be less depending on their age. Do not discuss weight. Set a meal and snack schedule. Teach them to listen to their bodies. Learn about intuitive eating. We're born intuitive eaters, right? You see an infant. When they're hungry, they cry. And when they're full, and they eat. And then when they're full, they stop. You can't force an infant to take a bottle, right? They just won't eat it. So, or, or to be breastfed, like they just won't eat. Eventually, as they get older, they're still intuitive eaters, but we start saying, no, you didn't eat enough. You need to have more if you want dessert. You have to have more veggies. We give them either a giant plate and we put tons of food on it and we expect them to finish it, or we don't give them enough. And then when they say, I'm still hungry, you say, no, you're not. So we teach them to ignore their hunger cues. So let's start honoring their hunger and teaching them to honor their hunger also. So with a toddler, I would say, give them a small portion at first. And then if they ask for more, great. Remove distractions, no screens while they eat. You want them to be eating mindfully. You want them to be paying attention to what they're eating. Um, and have that meal or snack routine be every two and a half to four hours, whatever it is. Um, remember that health is impacted by a lot of factors, not just weight. And your body has a very powerful reaction to re restriction. Something else I wanted to point out that I was actually talking about with Chevy, Sam, it, it's a learning life, was how we were saying that um, healthy foods, sometimes we forget that like, having access to more nutritious foods is really like a privilege. And not every culture um, or, or person has access to that. So the fact that we have access to that is really something that we kind of take for granted. So healthy eating is not always so easy and people can't always get fresh fruits and vegetables. So instead you can do frozen or canned, right? Why are we looking down on that stuff? Why are we saying like, oh, if it's not fresh, forget it. So then instead, what you're gonna pick up the french fries instead of the canned veggies, like take the canned veggies. I mean, take french fries too, but you can also have green beans in a can or whatever it is. Organic versus non-organic, there's the same nutrient makeup in organic versus non-organic. So why are we making one better than the other? Whatever you have access to, that's what you get. So I think, again, we kind of forget that that's like really a privilege that we have, that we have supermarkets that have this stuff, that it's so accessible to us. So it's not always, oh, you just don't want to be healthy. You're just making a choice not to you know, get the right foods and whatever. That's like a very snobby, judgmental, not nice thing to say. It's not always easy for people to get their hands on that stuff. Um, I'm gonna turn on my commenting just to let you ask any questions that maybe I didn't answer. But basically, kids should not be on diets. Teach them to accept themselves, to love themselves, to understand that their bodies are for moving and doing, that their bodies are a, a, an amazing vehicle for them. Encourage them to engage in health-promoting behaviors like movement, exercise for fun, not to burn off food and not to lose weight, exercise for health and eating healthfully again for health and I know a lot of people say to me you know oh well you know I was overweight and then I started exercising and 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 you know I and dieting and then I lost weight and and you know it's because of the diet that I ended up like being healthier and my answer then is no the reason your health improved was because you were exercising and you were being more mindful about what you were putting into your body right so, I mean, you were restricting and you lost weight, but the reason that you improved your health was probably because you were engaging in more health, healthy behaviors like exercise and making sure you were increasing the nutrient-dense foods that you eat and, and not eating foods that weren't so good for you. But I do want to, um, just reading comments also while I'm talking, but I do want to point out that nutrient-dense foods are amazing, but foods that are not so nutrient dense are also important because those are healthy for your mental health. Sometimes having that piece of ice cream cake 
makes us feel happy. There's an emotional association with food, which is not bad, right? Food is an emotional experience. I feel good, I feel happy, I know. My emotions tell me whether or not I like a food. So there's nothing wrong with having that ice cream cake once in a while. That's good for our mental health. I feel happy when I have an ice cream cake at a birthday party or when there's food to celebrate uh, something or other. Food is very much tied with our emotions and celebrations, happiness, sadness. So we're allowed to do that. Um, what happens if the child doesn't like any of the dinner choices and eats a drop and then gets hungry 20 minutes later? So again, you're deciding what's being served at the dinner table, right? You're putting out choices that you're going to give them stuff that they like. And you're also going to prepare foods in a way that they like them. And eventually, you should also fo follow a lot of these um, nutritionists who specialize in like feeding kids because they'll tell you the more you put a food out, the more likely it is for a child to eventually experiment with it and try it. They can take one bite and spit it out even, but you just, just say, wow, I'm so happy that you tried that, right? We don't criticize their eating. We don't evaluate it. You didn't eat enough. You didn't have any of the vegetables at the table. Whatever it is, you just ask, do you want some of this? No, no problem. But the more you put it out and the more you enjoy it, the more you, you, you increase the probability of them trying that food. So I want you guys to think about that. I want you to think about change for your family, not picking one child in the family and saying, oh, they need to exercise and they can't have certain foods. I've seen that. I've seen kids and families that everyone's getting a treat at the table and they can't have it because they're heavy. Um, or, you know, because their parents say, you had enough, you had a lot of lunch, so you can't have, but your sister can have. What? Like, what are you doing? That's mean and cruel. Um, so menu planning and cookings with, with kids can be a helpful way to have a more pleasant meal experience with them as well. Yes, thank you, Brachi. So getting them involved in the kitchen, having them say to them, you know what, guys, what do you want for dinner next week? Let's make a menu together. We do that in my house. What do you guys want for dinner? So that they're, like, excited, and it's not like, oh, chicken burgers again, and then they don't like it, right? Okay, so tell me, what do you guys like? Let's talk... You know, you want hamburgers? Great. You want tacos? Awesome. Let's figure out what we want. Um, and again, when they say like, oh, you know, we want hot dogs one night, you're not like, mm, that's really unhealthy. We don't eat hot dogs. Make a night for hot dogs. You could have that. Um, so how do you promote your family healthy eating? I, I talked about that just now for like 30 minutes. So watch this over again. Um, but that's what you're going to do. You're going to promote those behaviors by engaging in them yourself, not focusing on one child in the family, and by you changing your philosophy and your attitude around health and weight. And again, getting this book, Intuitive Eating, it's a great start. It teaches you so much about diet culture and the mentality around food and um, all the unhealthy attitudes we have about um what we put into our bodies and about how we put foods into our bodies. So just really important for you to, um, to read that. Can you list the accounts that use intuitive eating? Yes. So Evelyn Triboli is one of them. I'm going to, I'll, I'll put them down in a list, but Evelyn is one of them. Happily fed is another one. Um, Rachel Goodman is, is great. Um, anyone else that you guys can think of, like while I'm talking, you can tag in the comments. But there's so many um, that you should be looking at. Kids Eat in Color, she's a great one. She talks a lot about like feeding your kids. Um, elementary Nutrition, I think, is her is another one. I don't remember their exact um, Instagram names, but I'll tag a bunch of them. And they talk about feeding kids and you know, encouraging healthful behaviors and getting your kids to eat those foods that are nutritious for them. So important. So summary tonight, Kerbo Health is a terrible idea. It is not going to help your kids. It's not going to solve any kinds of problems about health. Um, feeding littles. Okay, that's a great one. Thank you, Basia. Um, it's not going to encourage health because weight does not mean health. And I want you guys to drill that into your head. You can be in a bigger body and be healthier than someone in a smaller body. Weight is not determined by the way you look, not at all. Health is determined by your, again, internal state, right? We can only determine health by looking at what's going on inside of your body. And the way you, you enhance your health is through activity, through movement, through rest, through happiness and reducing stress being around people that you like, getting rid of those toxic relationships. Your mental health affects your physical health, right? We know the mind-gut connection. We hear a lot about that. It's true. 
There are gastrointestinal issues that are caused from stress. Um, Facebook group, Intuitive Eating and Body Positivity for Jewish Women. Great. Intuitive RD, right. That's a great one. Thank you, Karen. Yes. Um, so these are great resources. Start following these. And I know so many people have told me since they started following these body acceptance, body positivity accounts, intuitive eating, their minds have been totally turned around. And even for myself, I have been turned around by this. I have seen such a change in my mentality and how I view my myself and my eating. And I was also very much a victim of weight stigma and, and no, not a victim of, beat, of weight stigma, but someone who, who had weight stigmas herself and was very much part of Nourishkeit also from Project Proactive. Um, I also had um, diet culture ingrained into my thinking so and body image issues, of course. We all struggle with them. So now that I'm learning more and more about this, I've found that I have become so healed um, and I think it's so important that we start for the next generation to do the same. Um, and I know that, you know, I have a daughter who's like in that age, that 13 year old age, and this is a lot of the discussion that she hears. Um, so I'm so happy that I'm doing my part to kind of like make her immune to that. Um, and that she knows that that's not okay. Like that's not how we discuss our bodies and that's not what's important. Um, and that we have to honor and respect ourselves through, again, healthy behaviors, which mean not being skinny. It means being active, eating the foods that nourish us, again, mentally and physically. So yeah, having fruits and vegetables, but also having ice cream sometimes, and also having the french fries, and also going out for pizza, doing those things. That's important. Um, and when you go to your doctor, and actually thank you for the reminder, when you go to your doctor and they start kind of like pushing on you about losing weight and you know oh and you know you're kind of heavy and your blood pressure's high and you need to lose weight then you can speak up for yourself and say you know what like my weight I don't know if my weight has anything to do with this let's look at other factors first and again saying that question what would you tell someone who is thin who came in with the same with high blood pressure thin people have high blood pressure or low blood pressure what would you tell them right so that's important advocate for yourself Educate your doctor. Just because they're a doctor doesn't mean they know more than you. They're just as much a, um, you know, a part of the problem as anyone else is. If they have their own stigmas and their own judgments, like you should educate them and speak up about it and don't be ashamed. And if they say something in front of your child about your child's weight, say, you know, hey, I just want to let you know like that's not going to fly the next time we're here. Like we don't talk about weight in my family. All due respect. Thank you so much. And if they can't respect that and they still go on about the child's weight and well, I'm concerned about it, find a new doctor because that's so damaging for your child to feel like they're being judged based on their weight and that they're less than or unhealthy because it's just not true. And then I would give the message over of, you know what, that some people think that being a, a, a heavier weight means that you're like not healthy and that you're less than, and that's not true. I don't believe that you're perfect the way you are. And we take care of our bodies the way that Hashem intended us to. And don't listen to that outside noise. Um, something actually, one other thing I want to bring up is I got a message from someone who was saying that she felt that she grew up heavy and she was bullied by kids who, you know, called her fat and whatever. And she felt like maybe her mother failed her because her mom didn't defend, you know, didn't say like, you know what, like, yeah, maybe we should do something about your weight and maybe we should like help you lose weight. Instead, she was kind of like, you're beautiful and that's it. And I want to address that and say that I don't think her mother failed her by not putting her on a diet. I think that there were obviously emotional issues that were not being addressed. Um, if she was overweight, overweight and unhappy, if she felt uncomfortable in her skin. So her mother didn't fail her, not by putting her on a diet. She didn't fail her in that way. She failed her in the way that she didn't address maybe some of the emotional needs that her daughter had. I think the fact that she did not put her on a diet was actually a great thing. And her mom didn't give in to those kids who were bullying her. She didn't validate them and say, well, actually, yeah, Connie, you, you are fat. You know what? You should go on a diet. Those kids are right, right? Th that would have been the wrong answer to say that, yeah, you are fat and there's something wrong with you. Instead, she didn't even acknowledge that. Like, no, you're beautiful and you're perfect and like, don't listen to that. Um, so I think that that's maybe something, a mindset that ne needs to be changed. Not that, well, my mom didn't know I was suffering, you know, in the weight that I was in and she should have done something about it your mom should have done something about your emotional suffering, not about your weight. And she should have helped address that. Maybe the emotional eating that was going on, if there was emotional eating. 
um, and emotional eating in terms of like numbing yourself and not feeling your feelings, that kind of stuff. How to respond when my kids call someone fat. They're using it for descriptive purposes, not to bash. So, and same, same response as when they call someone skinny, yes. There's skinny shaming too, definitely. Um, it's a problem and it's not okay for kids to comment on other people's bodies and say, oh, you're so skinny, you're so lucky. Oh, you have no butt. Oh, I wish I looked like you. Did you lose weight? Not okay. We're not allowed to skinny shame. We're not allowed to fat shame. And when your kids call someone fat, I would talk about it, just that we don't talk about people's bodies. We don't, we don't describe how people look. It's just not okay. Like, that's just not respectful. Um, and I would say, like, let's focus more on who they are and what we like about them. And, but again, fat's not a bad thing. Everybody has fat. So I would wonder, like, are they saying they're fat because they're big? So then I would kind of get more specific. Why are you saying they're fat? What does that mean? Ask questions. Doctors also push parents when their kids are too small and force them to eat. Right, they do. I mean, sometimes it depends. Like, so I take, you know, one of my kids to the doctor and she's little, like she's small and petite and she's very low on those BMI scales. And you would think according to those scales, she's like a skeleton, like malnourished, like as if, if you just looked at the chart, you would think Rachel starves her kid. But if you look at her, she's totally healthy, active, super active, can run, jump, play basketball, jump rope, amazing. So the doctor's like, you know what? Like, we're gonna ignore it and I'm not even looking at this. I know that if it was the other way around though, if she was high on that BMI scale because maybe she had a bigger build or she was a little bit, you know, tall and, and broader, then he would be like, mm, what is she eating? How much of this does she have? How much is that does she have? It would be a different story. So. I mean, I don't think my doctor, but I think maybe some doctors would be more concerned than if her BMI was high. Um, if someone got really skinny, you never know if they have a medical issue. If you compliment them on their weight loss, you might be complimenting their sickness. Yes, this actually happened to a friend of mine. Her dad was sick. He had cancer and he was dying. And he was like a bigger guy his whole life. And he started losing weight because he was dying. And people kept coming up to him and being like, you look, Dan, you look amazing. What are you doing? He was like, um, I have cancer. That's what I'm doing. It's called the cancer diet where your body is just killing itself. So it's so insensitive. And again, people assume, oh, he's losing weight. He's so healthy. He had cancer and he was dying and then he did die. So again, just proves the point of like how weight stigma is so backwards. And I posted this, this Twitter story of this woman who went to the doctor with protein in her urine and the doctor was like, oh, I think you need to lose some weight probably. You know, you're overweight. That's probably what it is. Come back to me in four months. Watch what you eat. Nothing out of the box. And she just did not feel good. And she knew there was something up. And so she went for another opinion. And that doctor ended up telling her, like, your protein is way too high. There's something wrong. And it turned out that she had cancer. So again, I think doctors are missing the mark. They're assuming that being fat is the problem or having a bigger body is the problem and that's what's making you unhealthy. And if a thin patient came with the same problem, protein in the urine, they would have been a lot more, okay, let's figure out what's going on here. They wouldn't have jumped right away to, you have to lose weight. So it's dangerous. It's dangerous to have these ideas. It's dangerous to be thinking that and saying that to people. So I guess what I want you to take away from tonight then is that weight has nothing to do with health. That is the, the summary. What does, Increase our health is not losing weight, but engaging in more healthful behaviors like movement, exercise, rest, taking care of our mental health, going to a therapist, eating foods that make us feel good, that energize us, and also eating the foods that make us feel good emotionally and mentally too, right? So having that balance of both. Um, what Brachi says here, tragic. Think of how many people would have felt too much shame to follow their gut terrible yes and you know what's also crazy that they've done research that shows that people who are considered overweight or obese don't go to doctors they don't go to gyms they don't want to engage in in behaviors that would promote health because of the shame and the judgment so we're not helping anyone by talking about you need to lose weight you're not healthy if you're fat you're not doing anything good for anyone like that. You're just keeping them away from doing the behaviors that they should be doing to promote health, right? So they're in that bigger body and they don't want to exercise then. They don't want to take care of their health. They don't want to go to the doctor to check their blood sugar or to make sure everything's okay because they know their doctor's going to take one look at them after they weigh them and they're going to be like, mm, okay, so 
how, how much ice cream are you having during the week? Maybe you should cut back on that, right? Something I would say also is when your child gets weight on the scale, my doctor actually does this, have them turn away from the scale, that they're not looking at the number. Um, and I keep saying, oh, and one more thing, one more thing. But another thing that came up in my messages um, is like, and this is like a personal story. I remember when I was pregnant with, I would say even up till my last one, I had this fear of weight gain. Um, and I remember making the biggest deal when I went to the doctor in my last pregnancy where I was really just enjoying the pregnancy and not watching what I was eating and just like, I was exercising, but I was not like so strict about what I was putting in my body. And I remember that when I went to the scale and they, you know, they moved that thing, it's like cha chunk to the next part of the scale. I was like devastated. I was like, oh, oh, that never happens in my pregnancy. Like that where they move that big block on the scale. I was like traumatized by that. And then I came home and I was like, oh my God, I'm watching what I'm eating. I can't believe I gained so much weight. And I was pregnant. I'm supposed to gain weight. I'm growing a person in my body. Why am I obsessing about this? I can exercise. I can do whatever. And when this baby is born, like, I won't be at that weight anymore. And even if I am, who cares? It's just a number. But I was so obsessed with, like, I had to be under a certain weight when I was pregnant. That's how twisted <laughs> the sound effects. Cha chong It was really bad. I was so obsessed with this, like, I need to be under a certain amount. And I can't, I can't have them move that block into the next part of the scale. Um that was really upsetting to me. And I look back at it now and I'm like, so upset at myself that that was what I was focusing on, that that's what was important to me um, during pregnancy. Kids are supposed to be growing. When you're pregnant, your body is supposed to grow. When you're a child, your body is supposed to grow. You're not supposed to be shrinking yourself. There is no healthy way to put a child on a diet. There's just not. You can increase healthy behaviors, and that's not losing weight. Healthy behaviors are, again, I'm a broken record here, exercise, eating food that nourishes their body and nourishes their, their, their minds. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, people think they can comment more on your body when you're pregnant. People think they can comment on your body all the time. You lose weight, you look amazing. Wow, whoa, you're so skinny. Stop talking about people's bodies. Hey, hey, it's so good to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. Wow, I've missed you. Hey, I haven't seen you around in forever. How's your summer going? Talk about those things, right? Instead of like, you look amazing, you're gorgeous, you're so skinny, I'm so jealous. You're anorexic. Why is that a compliment? Why is that a compliment? What's your secret? Right, Barry, thank you. What's your secret? What, 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 I have like a chronic illness. I have, like I said, my, my friend's dad. I have cancer, that's why I'm so skinny. You know, just like, let's stop doing that. It's just not healthy, it's not okay. And our kids are hearing, they're hearing those compliments and they're thinking, oh, that's how I should look. Um, and that's just sad. So I hope I answered all those questions. I feel like I rambled for a very long time. This is something I'm so passionate about. I will be talking about it in my stories for a while because this is a problem, not just in the Jewish community. Like this isn't, and I know people are like, oh, in Orthodox Jewish communities, it's like the worst. No, it's bad everywhere. It's not just a problem within our community. Um, it's a problem everywhere. So it's not exclusive or worse in our community. I think that, um, that I'm just reading comments also while I talk. I can't multitask. I think that we need to, focus on just eliminating the problem like in general and not blaming Jewish, not Jewish, shidduch, crisis, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's a problem everywhere. And again, your eight-year-old is not like looking for a date and a shidduch to get married. Like, so why are you putting them on a diet? You're just, again, all the stories that I've heard and I got so many messages today and yesterday were from people that were at Weight Watchers when they were 10 years old, when they were 12 years old, when they were 14 years old, and they still struggle with their weight, and they still have eating disorders, or they still have shame. So it doesn't work. Don't bring your kids to a nutritionist. Don't bring your kids to Weight Watchers. Don't put them on a diet. It doesn't help. What to say to people who give those comments? So if someone's like, oh my God, you lost so much weight, I would just say, you know what? I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm just enjoying my life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm having a great summer. Or, or, or you know what, I, I'm happy. Say things like that, like switch it to like how you're doing. Or you could even say, I'm trying like not to focus so much on how I look. Like, tell me that you missed me. You know, depending who you're talking to. If it's your friend, you could be like, um, like shut up, don't talk about my body, right? Depending who it is. What if a child is severely obese, should something be said? So 
I addressed this in the very beginning. No, you should never tell a child they are overweight. Again, you should be promoting healthy behaviors, which means exercise, eating foods that are nutritious for them, being happy, getting enough sleep. Watch from the beginning. I talked about all of this in the beginning. You never say anything to a child about their weight. You never put them on a diet. And it starts with you, the parent. If you want to change behaviors in the house, it starts with you. Um, you have to make sure that you're deciding what snacks are in the house. You have to decide what the dinner is, right? Don't blame your kids. You're the parent. You decide what's for dinner. You decide what you're putting out. So if you don't like the foods that they're choosing, make sure that there's better foods in the house for them. And again, making space for those foods that aren't so healthy. That's it, you know? If you restrict and you never let candy in your house and you never let them have ice cream or french fries, they're gonna find it and they're not gonna be able to stop. Our brain wants what it can't have. So um, you should really be making sure that there's a balance of having those treats and not having the treats. So I feel like I repeated myself a lot for a long time, but um, yes, Brachi said it's a boundary we can choose to put up. When people comment on your body, you can have that boundary of letting them know that that's just not okay with you. And if you're close to your friends, they'll know this about you. They'll know that you don't want to talk about bodies. Um, what if there's a teenager who loves junk and helps herself to food? So let her have. Again, there's only so much junk, right? I don't like to even use that word junk anymore. But there's only so much candy a person can have. So let her have it until she doesn't want to have it anymore. That's it. You know, and again, you offer those balanced meals so she can have that candy in between. Eventually, she'll stop. Um, they get so much candy in camp. Yeah, they do, but guess what? Eventually, they just don't want to have it anymore. Um, my daughter was telling me last year in camp, she came to camp. I sent her snacks and whatever, and I did not send her broccoli. I sent her like snacks that she would really like have fun with, and she said like within a week into camp she had eaten so much of that food that fun food right the not so healthy food that like when lunch came she like went straight to the salad bar she was having loading up on like veggies and protein and healthy food because her body craved it that's what happens so if i had sent her like granola bites and whatever like she probably would not have kind of moved towards that food but her body craved it our bodies crave that healthy food so let them have candy. But again, you, you balance how much you have in the house and when they have access to it. My kids can access that candy drawer in my house whenever they want. It's not high up. It's not locked up. They don't touch it except for Shabbos. Sometimes during the week, can I have a Hershey kiss? Can I? Yeah, no problem. But they don't, it's not like tempting for them because they know it's not off limits. So letting your kids have that, I always know the kids that don't get candy at home because they go straight to that drawer. They come to my house and they're like yanking open the cupboards and like searching through, through the candy. So I know who doesn't get candy at home, I can tell. My kids are just not like that because I've never made it like off limits. Like they just, it's, it's there and yeah, you can have it if you want, but that's it. People locking a pantry, again, like that's so not healthy and not safe. Um, and if you're locking a pantry, then again, you have a problem on your hands that goes far beyond like they just like candy. There's an emotional problem that needs to be dealt with. So um, I hope that you guys learned a lot about this. Um, what about a toddler? Toddlers, again, division of responsibility. Look it up. Ellen, Sa Ellen Satter, read about it. She talks a lot about how to feed your infant toddler through teens. Um, I hope you learned a lot. And if you have any other questions, watch this again because I feel like I answered them all. And start following those accounts. I'll, I'll tag some in my stories for you to see who is um, great for you to learn more about this. And get this book, Intuitive Eating, Evelyn Triboli. Follow her. Um, hey Tiffany Rowe also is great. You should follow her. She's amazing. And guys, get rid of this Kerbo app. Don't download it. And if you know someone who wants to, tell them, go check out this Instagram account. Learn about diet culture. Learn about putting your kids on diets. Like, it's damaging them. It's so bad for their mental health. It's so bad for their physical health. We can't do it. Um, also, go to my highlights. I talk about diet culture. I have, a, I have three highlights that are all related to this. Diet culture, beauty sick, talks about body image, um, and um, kids on diets, I called it. So those three, um, those three highlights are what I want you to look at. 
Um, so hopefully I will hear, uh, you know, I'll hear from you guys. Um, and I'm going to save this to my YouTube. It'll be saved here now. And um, I'll keep talking about this because I, I can't let parents do this to their kids. I just, I can't. And diet culture has got to go. So hopefully you guys are learning with me. You're learning how toxic diet culture is. Um, and if this is the first you're hearing about it, look into it more. So that's it. Have a great night. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Bye. Good night.